From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. As the nation continues to try and come to terms with the horrific tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut, some policymakers are calling for a seismic shift in our gun control legislation. Earlier this week, President Barack Obama announced the formation of a task force headed by Vice President Joe Biden. They are charged with giving the president a set of recommendations to reduce gun violence by January. This week on Newsmakers, we check in with two members of the Rhode Island delegation. Congressman David Cicilline joins us on the second half of the program, but first. Joining me from the Senate studios in Washington, D.C., Senator Jack Reed. Senator, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you, Tim. What elements must be in any gun control legislation for you to support it? Well, we have to first uh, make access to military type assault weapons uh, a, a very uh, difficult. Uh, second, we have to ensure that they're not the ability to also buy large size magazines, clips that can be fed into these weapons. Uh, then I think we have unfinished business with respect to background checks at uh, gun shows. That's something that I've worked with on a bipartisan basis with John McCain and uh, we've attempted to do that. So there are several measures that I think would be essential, but the biggest issue is to try to, to, to uh, prevent the, the ready access to these military type assault weapons. I served in the Army. I've I've used these weapons. They were designed to engage and, and kill personnel. Uh, and I think we have to recognize that and limit their access, their general access. Senator, you've been a strong advocate for stricter gun laws throughout your career. We should point out the NRA has even given you the letter grade of an F for your voting record. Are you disappointed at all that the president failed to champion gun control legislation in his first term? Well, uh, the president, as we all know, was uh, preoccupied not only by the, the great economic crisis we face, but also winding down the war in Iraq and beginning the process, the same process in Afghanistan. Uh, but I think more could have been done. And frankly, I, I, I think his recent efforts are commendable, and I think he even recognizes that more could or should have been done. Uh, but uh, inattention to uh, these issues uh, precedes pr President Obama. I mean, I can remember in 2004 trying to defend uh, uh, against efforts by the NRA to, to provide even more protections uh, from, from liability suits for, for gun dealers. And it, Ironically, Senator McCain and I got on that bill an amendment to close the gun show loophole, and because we were successful, the NRA essentially suggested to, to all their supporters, even co-sponsors, the bill to vote against the bill. It went down in 05, but it came back with more Republican senators uh, supporting it in 05, in 05, 2005. So we have seen, I think, uh, both at the executive level and at the legislative level, level, inattention to this issue, and I hope that's changed now by the demands, the public demands of the American people. You've never been, uh, you've never straddled the issue when it comes to gun control. Your stance is, is very overt. Um, do you wear the NRA's grade of the letter F as a, as a badge of honor? Uh, no, I don't. I, 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 this has to be based on, on, on common sense uh, balance between uh, rights and responsibilities. And it has to be in terms of public safety. Uh, you know, there, we recognize, I recognize that there are genuine sportsmen and women who enjoy uh, hunting, who those, that is something that's been part of our culture and tradition. But we have to be able to draw a line so that we don't have these incredible and, and heart-wrenching incidents as we saw in Newtown, Connecticut, when we saw elsewhere. And I think we can and we should draw that line and provide the balance. It, it's, it's something that should be done. Uh, it shouldn't be about uh, one group or it should be about what's in the best interest of this country. I think a uh, few people would argue that anybody with a mental health issue should have access to, to weapons. But what about the deeper question here? As we now know, in Connecticut, it was Adam Lanza's mother who actually purchased um, those weapons. Do you think mm -hmm. the government should be looking into the mental health background of family members uh, in, in that sort of a background check? 
I think we have to recognize that uh, there's uh, several factors contributing to, to many of these deplorable incidents. Uh, one is the access to firearms, and we have to work on that. The other is, in many cases, the mental health of the perpetrator. Uh, that argues not so much, I think, for more elaborate checks of everyone he or she might know or be related to. It, it requires more investment in mental health for, for all Americans. And one of the ironies at this moment, you know, as we're talking about trying to deal and cope with the crisis in all dimensions in Connecticut, you know, there are efforts to, to cut funding away from Medicaid programs that provide support for mental health clinics. There's, there's been an effort to defund a lot of programs that could provide genuine help to people who have mental health problems, regardless of whether they own or have access to weapons. So there are, there are two related issues here. Are we going to have reasonable, balanced uh, access to firearms, and are we going to have a program of support for people with mental health issues, not just because they might come in contact with a gun, it's because it's the right thing to do for them and for the country overall. I was reading a report this morning out of Washington, D.C., that Senator Jay Rockefeller has introduced a bill uh, that would have the National Academy of Sciences look at any link between violent video games and media and violent acts by children. Do you support that legislation? Well, I would support a study. I think we have to recognize that uh, uh, it is really a, a different world than the one that cer certainly I grew up in terms of uh, what's on television, what's easily accessible to children, what in fact is marketed to children in terms of entertainment. You know, I've seen some of these these games and uh, they are starkly uh, engaged in someone sort of destroying as many opponents, if you will, as they can, using weapons, using all sorts of different uh, instruments. And I think we do have to look at it, uh, you know, because there is a, a cultural context uh, to everyone's actions as well as the individual characteristics, whether they have a mental health issue or not. And I think it, it, Looking at it and coming up with with suggestions would be a positive step forward, recognizing that it's very difficult, particularly because of you know people's right to have access to a whole range of information to 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 sort of regulate that. But I think asking the right questions and tough questions will help us understand it much better. I want to uh, pivot back to the NRA uh, to wrap this converse, uh, part of the conversation up and we should point out to our viewers mm -hmm. that we're taping this earlier in the week and many people are watching this on, on a Sunday. I point that out because the NRA is uh, supposed to come out and uh, make a statement on Friday then they're going to be uh, apparently uh, doing a lot of the Sunday morning national shows. How powerful a group is the NRA in Capitol Hill? I, I saw that Mayor Michael Bloomberg said that, quote, their power is vastly overrated. Is he right or wrong? Well, I think their power does not compare to the power of the American people when they have uh, spoken. And I think the American people are beginning loudly to speak out about the, the dangers inherent in some of the uh, gun control, uh, gun laws that we have in the United States. So uh, there are groups organized around a host of issues across the board, economic issues and, and social issues. But I think the American people, that's the loudest voice. And if they speak loudly, then there's no one uh, special interest group that can uh, deflect their will on it. That's what I hope is going to happen. I hope that this national conversation about firearms and about protecting uh, all of our citizens, but particularly the school children, uh, will, will be more decisive than any type of uh, grassroots or political activity by an interest group. Senator, let's shift gears for a moment. The Senate Republicans have offered a $24 billion relief package for states still dealing with the damage of Superstorm uh, super Sandy. Is that enough? Uh, the package that we have in the, uh, in the Senate is uh, much more responsive to the actual damage suffered, not just in New York and New Jersey, but also along our coast in Rhode Island. I had the, uh, the, the privilege to be able to, to, to walk the Squamagat, the tunic over Satch West Point. Uh, we've suffered damage and we're working hard to see that we can get federal support, additional support. Uh, but uh, we've never, I think, in the past tried to uh, sh 
downsized necessary relief. When Katrina struck the Gulf Coast, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, there was an immediate response, a huge outpouring of resources to help them recover and to make significant modifications so that they wouldn't be vulnerable again. And we need the same response. So the, the Republican package is, is much too small. It doesn't recognize some of the colossal damage that's been suffered. And it doesn't also look longer term about you know, how do we modify and protect particular coastal areas so that we're not every year seeing the same type of damage. So I'm very supportive of the proposal that uh, my colleagues on, on the Democratic side uh, propose. In fact, um, I was helped author the parts with respect to the Department of the Interior, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and other agencies of the federal government. Uh, the proposal that the Senate, Dem Senate Democrats have put out there is more than $60 million, as you point out. That it's a lot more than the, right. the Republicans. How important is it to you, then? Are you willing to hold hostage bills that are near and dear to Senate Republicans' hearts to make sure that this goes through? Well, I don't... Uh, uh, hope, I, let me say, I hope it doesn't come to that because, again, when it's come to, to disaster relief, uh, we're seeing a whole new sort of approach. Uh, there was no uh, sort of brinksmanship and gaming when it came to Katrina. And frankly, most of those senators are, were Republicans. We, as Americans, saw the damage and responded as Americans, and that's how we should do it today. I hope it doesn't come to this point of sort of, you know, just trying to procedurally outguess or, or checkmate one side or the other. We've got people in uh, the Northeast that have, I'm told, in New Jersey, there's, there's in thousands and thousands of thousands of houses that can't be occupied yet. Some will never be occupied. Uh, the same thing in New York. We've seen the damage along our coast. It's very serious. I was in Musquamagat, as I said, not just to tour, but I went back a few days later and worked with some volunteers to help for a little bit or an hour or two or so to pick up some of the debris, et cetera, and just to, to see the community come together. So we're Americans. This is where you stick together and you provide adequate support, uh, not uh, uh, just a down payment. Our guest this week is Senator Jack Reed. We're speaking to him via satellite from Washington, D.C. Senator, progressive activists are criticizing you because so far you're refusing to support major changes to the Senate's filibuster rules. They released a poll showing that most Rhode Islanders want you to vote for changes. How do you defend your stance on the filibuster to frustrated Democrats? Well, uh, first of all, um, I am, as I try to do with everything, think very carefully about what we're doing uh, so that I can make the best possible decision on behalf of uh, all Rhode Islanders and indeed when it comes to the procedure of the Senate to the to the country at large, not just for the moment, for, but for the, for the future of the country. And so I haven't made a, 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 a conclusion. I'm looking very carefully. I understand the frustrations about procedural delays. I've seen it. I mean, I've been, there's no one who's been more outspoken about, for example, extending unemployment compensation benefits for out-of-work Rhode Islanders and out-of-work Americans. And I saw that in the last few years take three and four and five procedural votes. And then, of course, the irony is when the final vote comes, 98 senators vote. So this was not about the substance of the, of the proposal. It was just simply delay. That is frustrating. I understand that. But I want to make sure that what we do will not, uh, in the long run, uh, be a, a way in which uh, the, those same uh, individuals would come in and say, gee, you know, you should be able to stop this bad legislation. So what I'm talking about is trying to be careful, thoughtful about the proposal and make a decision you know, well before the time to vote and make that decision public. Senator, on a much lighter note, um, Rhode Island's own Olivia Culpo has been crowned Miss Universe. It's my understanding that she met with you earlier in the year, is that correct? She did. She's an extraordinarily poised and intelligent young lady. We should all be very, very proud of her. She came down uh, to urge for resources uh, for cancer research and cancer treatment. Uh, but I was just struck uh, by her, again, her poise, her, her intelligence, her, and her just innate 
ch decency and charm. I, 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 we all should join her parents and her family and just take pride in her as a, and she's a fellow Cranstonian, mm -hmm. so I have double pride. I have a, a hometown person makes it big. Uh, in, in fact, uh, she's the whole universe, not just uh, the United States. How did she do in your meeting? Did she have a future as a, as a lobbyist down in Washington? Well, I, she has the trouble that I never had to decide being a uh, classical cellist, a, a brilliant uh, lawyer, scientist, doctor, uh, a, 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 a statesperson. Uh, uh, she has unlimited uh, potential and, and options, and uh, but she carries it so well. She, she, you, you know, I left the meeting with just the, uh, the feeling, what a wonderful person. Uh, so it's, uh, she's just a very, very special. Senator Jack Reed, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you, Tim. When we come back, Congressman David Cicilline also joining us from Washington, D.C. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining us via satellite from Washington, D.C., Congressman David Cicilline. Congressman, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Good morning. What elements must be in any gun safety legislation for you to vote on it? Well, you know, we have a series of bills before Congress that I've co-sponsored that really get at a couple of issues. One is we need to uh, eliminate the, the availability of firearms to people who are dangerously mentally ill or have criminal records. And so we need to fix our background check system. We need to close the loopholes that allow 40 percent of gun sales to go without a background check, no questions asked, so that people who have criminal records or maybe seriously mentally ill uh, can buy a gun. So we need to fix that system. We need to ban assault weapons. Weapons. We need to reenact the assault weapon ban, and we need to ban high-capacity, large-round assault ammunition that is used in these assault weapons. Uh, those are some steps we can take. There are bills other than the assault ban. All those other issues currently are in legislation pending before the Congress that we could pass tomorrow. So I think, you know, w what we have seen in Sandy Hook is the most recent of massacres, um, all horrific, but this one especially horrific because it involved the slaughter of 20 any innocent children and their teachers. And we have got to pass this legislation that will help mitigate uh, some of the dangers of gun violence in this country. Congressman uh, Sandy Hook, clearly one of the most horrific mass killings we have seen, but certainly not the first. And we did have some um, mass shootings uh, earlier in the last four years. Are you disappointed by the president's inaction on gun control in his first term? Well, you know, yesterday I hosted uh, for the Brady campaign, the Brady campaign to, uh, to uh, end gun violence, uh, families uh, of victims from Aurora and from uh, Virginia Tech and from Columbine, who are all, you know, lending their voices to this. And it seems like every time we have one of these horrible mass shootings, there's a lot of hand wringing, and everyone says we need to do something, and then it passes from people's memory. And I hope that what happened in Sandy Hook is going to inspire everyone that the time for conversation, for dialogue is over. We need to take action. I'm pleased that the president announced today that he would be leading this effort. We've got to enact responsible gun safety legislation. The, the vast majority of responsible gun owners support these kinds of reasonable uh, laws that I'm talking about that will ensure that we keep communities safe. Uh, it's going to require everyone to work together, Republicans and Democrats, led by our president, and really by the whole country coming together and saying, enough is enough. We are not meeting our responsibility to protect our children. We can do better than this, and we need to enact some of the laws I'm talking about that will do that. But, Mayor, you've been out front on gun safety or gun control legislation because you were uh, the mayor of an urban city, and you've been uh, pushing that sort of action for a long time. So, again, the question is, are you disappointed in the president's first term on this issue? Well, I'm... I mean, I'm a, a founding member of the Mayors Against Illegal Guns, as, as you mentioned. And, you know, I was with Carolyn McCarthy today, who has been in this fight for 18 years, uh, who lost her husband to gun violence. So, you know, this is, a, I'm disappointed that we haven't enacted responsible gun safety legislation. That's the responsibility of Congress. Uh, that's the responsibility of the president to sign. And I think our country is going to demand it. But uh, this is, this has not been enacted for a very long time. Uh, I'm disappointed that that hasn't happened. I've been fighting for it, I think.
the recent events in Sandy Hook um, have really made this a different kind of conversation. I think people understand that we, as the president said, even if we can't solve every part of this problem, it is no excuse for inaction, and we need to take action. There's legislation that the, that we have before Congress. Uh, we had a press conference today with many members of, 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 the Repub of the Democratic Caucus. We're trying to invite our Republican friends on the so other side of the aisle to be part of this. But this is really action Congress needs to take, uh, both in the House and the Senate. And uh, I'm happy the president's going to lead, lead this effort. But we need to take the action. And we have bills pending right now that we could pass that would make a real difference. So you have bills pending right now uh, in Congress. The president on Wednesday announced that he is uh, He's appointing an interagency task force led by Vice President Joe Biden. He set a January deadline for right. recommendations. Um, is that fast enough for you if you have legislation pending right now? Well, I mean, we're, we're getting ready to come upon the, the recess, and we're still in the middle of uh, negotiations on the fiscal cliff. So, you know, we're going to be back on January 3rd. So I think the president was very clear that this is urgent and uh, the highest priority of the administration and that they will get to work on this immediately. And um, I think, you know, I would love us to move on the bills that we have right now. Uh, but if it means uh, including lots of other stakeholders to be part of it so that we can make sure that we're successful and it happens in January, I think that that's a, a timetable which uh, certainly is acceptable to me. Do you think the government should be looking into the mental health of family members, immediate family members, before approving the sale of a weapon? Well, I think in most states there are d uh, disqualifying factors, you know, a criminal record, uh, an adjudicated mental illness. So there are there is disqualifying information, which I think probably would work sufficiently. The problem is that there are the system is so broken that in many instances that information about the mental health condition uh, or about the criminal background of individuals is not put into the system. And so 40 percent of gun sales, in addition to that, are made without a background check at all and so uh, you know that's the problem so we need to fix the system so that the information the disqualifying information is in the system I think we do should do that first and uh, I think if we do that we'll see dramatic improvements close the gun show loophole make sure every sale of a gun has a background check attached to it eliminate again the kind of assault weapons that that's only purpose it is to shoot a large number of weapons at a very fast pace uh, that really you know uh, do tremendous damage to communities and to, to families and to uh, to those who are victimized by gun violence. So we can do some of those things right away uh, and I think obviously part of that has to be seriously investing in our mental health system so that people have access to mental health treatment. There have been substantial reductions in mental health services over the last several years. That We have got to reverse that and really put the kinds of resources that are necessary to provide treatment to those suffering with mental illness. I'm interested in the gun show uh, loophole that you mentioned there uh, obviously for a lot of people that's that's a no-brainer if, if you're gonna get a background check when you go to a, a gun shop you should get one when you go to a gun show but I'm wondering how realistic um, that is any any kind of crackdown into the gun so-called gun show loophole it's a, it's a favorite talking point but how do you how do you actually do something about it how can the government possibly track or check gun sales between individuals which is what happens at these gun shows well I mean you, yeah I mean you make you pass a law that requires it I mean we don't even have that so the enforcement uh, is one question but let's pass the law because you can in fact require for every sale of a firearm at a gun show or every private sale that there be a background check and and actually, this is one of the issues where there's pretty broad agreement. I think 70% uh, of NA, NRA members support fixing the background check system. So I think people recognize that at the very bare minimum, we should prevent those who are not permitted to have firearms, either because they're mentally ill, they have a criminal record, or not uh, sufficiently old enough, that we ought to have a system that works properly. And this gaping hole that allows 40% of gun sales to avoid a background check at all um, is something we can fix should fix and I think most responsible gun owners agree with that. Um, the motions after Sandy Hook are still raw and a lot of um, tough questions are being asked. One of them that is being raised is should the country examine allowing school administrators to be armed? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I think that is a 
preposterous idea. There is no evidence. In fact, all the evidence is to the contrary. More guns equals more violence. The notion that you inject more guns into a situation will reduce violence. There is no data to support that. The data is actually the reverse. And we want our schools to be safe places for students to learn and to grow and to, for teachers to teach. And the idea of injecting into our schools guns, uh, I think, is a ridiculous idea. We have less than a minute left, so I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Because I'm, I'm just curious, um, sure. and this all plays into it, but what's the tone like down in Washington, D.C.? It was so acrimonious before November. Is it, is it better now, or do you think it's the same? Well, I mean, I think everyone, as, as everyone in this country, has been really affected by what happened in Sandy Hook. I mean, people are, um, you know, this is, this is the lives of 20 little angels, 20 children and their teachers. So I think it has had a very sobering impact on people on both sides of the aisle who are really committed to figuring out how do we stop this kind of violence in our country. And I think there will be a commitment to work together. We're seeing it already with some statements from folks on the other side of the aisle. So I'm optimistic that, that we'll be able to work together and enact some, some really good legislation that will make okay. a real difference in the lives of Americans. Congressman David Cicilline from the House Student in Washington, D.C. We sincerely thank you uh, for taking the time and your busy schedule to talk to us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Tim. I want to thank everyone for watching Newsmakers and from everyone here at Eyewitness News. Have a happy and safe holiday. From me, Happy New Year's as my colleague Ted Nisi will be filling in for me next week on Newsmakers.